I'm right up that edge. I'm not gonna say we're gonna kill out of this tree, but I bet you we have a shooter encounter out of this tree. I mean, you can't ask for a plan to go any better. Gavin, that's the spot. I think he was standing about right here. The biggest white tail I've ever shot at, and unfortunately did not recover. I mean, that's why I moved to Iowa to have shots like that, and we're gonna take you guys through that story today. But before we get started on that, I wanna talk a little bit about this property. When you go back, this is a permission farm that Caleb has had for years. He's always referred to it as the river farm. And in 2022, he told me, hey man, come down and hunt it with me, which I was just tickled to death, just knowing the history of this farm, and being a fan of Midwest Whitetail before I moved out here. But where we're standing right now is a large cornfield. And in 2019, even before that, for many years, it was CRP. And that's when Caleb and Collins were hunting it a lot. Had a ton of great encounters over the years, and they really had this property pretty dialed in. And Caleb and Collins were kind of capitalizing on the transition between the ag to the north, the CRP, all the way to the lower south bedding. And if you guys remember specifically back to 2020, Caleb shot that deer called Tripod, and that was the deer with his antlers actually popped off after he shot him, but that south to north movement, now granted, Caleb and Collins had a food plot here that year, they had a green plot on the west side, but that south to north movement in the evenings was pretty evident through those hunts. You'd see a lot of those deer, they come through, stop at the green plot, and then head off to the north to larger ag fields. In 2021, that's when the big change happened. That's when this got converted from CRP back to Tillable Acres. And Caleb didn't hunt down here too much. I was an intern, it was my first year in Iowa. I was filming Mike exclusively at that point until I got my residency and harvested the Big 8 late season, my first Iowa buck. But in 2022, Caleb and I become pretty close friends and he knew I didn't really have anywhere to hunt at the time outside being able to hunt with Mike and hunt on Mike's farm. But he said, Rye, if you want to, come down here and hunt with me. And for me, it's like back where I'm from, you don't really have people like that who are willing to just give something to that somebody. And that meant a lot to me. That year, Caleb and Casey, they hunted a good bit on the west side for a deer that Caleb was called the Beast. It's a deer he had a lot of history with at the time. And they had a couple encounters with him, but one notable one that really illustrates that north to south pattern in the morning is when Casey was in there with a the muzzleloader. And he came across the west section of that field just below the terraces, moving back to the bedding to the south. But through that year, I actually just didn't hunt down here much. You know, Mike and I were really busy with the quest for Kelsey, and then we went to Arizona after that. And by that time, when I had time to hunt, it was late season. And I made one sit down here late season. And just to kind of wrap that all up, one pattern had held true through this, whether it's mornings or evenings, south to north and north to south movement. So here it is, midsummer 2023. And my main goal is to figure out this farm, how the deer utilize it, and what the best way to hunt it is. And one big change on the farm this year was the crop rotation. 2022, the west side had the corn. This year, the east side has the corn. Obviously not spending much time here in 2022. I really only had trail cam pictures to go off of. And then Caleb and I also talk a lot and I have a lot of historical information from him. With both of our careers being on the land management side of things, Caleb obviously has his business. He's doing a lot of work there. And me working for Mike, we don't always line up on when we can both be here at the same time. And somehow the stars aligned in July 26th, we were able to come out here, get our cuttybacks running. We put out some ax one to try and start our buck inventory for that year. Two days go by and the first good buck on camera is tight 10, of course. And he blew up. Like, <laughs> again, I go back to this thing where I love tight, tall deer with masks. 
And I said that as an intern with the big eight. And again, that deer was there. And I was like, all right, it's go time. Let's make a plan. And on that day, um, intern at the time, Shay McTy actually flew the drone and I was going through the drone shots and there's these two patches of corn that are severely deer damaged. And Caleb and I started talking like, let's use that to our advantage. Monster Buck makes a blend specifically designed for broadcasting the ag and that's the overcast blend. And that brings us to the 11th of August and that's the day I came in to put these plots in and the day I identified this tree over my shoulder for a stand placement. They're tearing the heck out of this corn. We're down here on a farm we call the River Farm. This is a farm that Caleb's been gracious enough to give me permission to hunt with him. Uh, super thankful to him. We came out here a couple weeks ago and put some ax out just to kind of get an inventory on the farm. And the first good deer on camera, of course, is tight 10. And with me having limited days to hunt throughout the year because I film Mike full time, I'm just trying to maximize and get the most intel and give myself the best chance to target this deer. And one of the things we're doing today is trying to make some little quote unquote, extremely poor man plots. This is a spot where there's a ton of corn damage from the deer. It's just been annihilated and there's a lot of sunlight getting to this area of the ground. So Monster Bug makes a blend called the Overcast Blend, which is designed for broadcasting the standing ag. And with this spot having this much damage and this much sunlight reaching the ground, I'm gonna try the regular Braska Blend and see how that works. And in a week or two, if I don't have germination, I'll probably come back with the overcast, add 25, 50 pounds of rye to it. Hopefully we'll have some kind of plot here to target uh, tight 10. It's about 6.30 right now, so we're running out of daylight. <laughs> Well, it's like three pounds I put out for like a quarter acre. It's a little bit heavy, but I want a little heavy just because of the fact that I don't know if all this is gonna germinate. So it's kind of a test really, just to see how it works. And like I say, if it doesn't come back, we'll come back with Monster Bucks Overcast. Have ourselves a nice little fall plot here. So I think we're gonna go check the other spot where we can put a plot. Let's get going. Chance, are you tired, buddy? I'm tired, it's humid. That access, you could get out where we park the truck normally and just get get in the creek. So if you look on Onyx, what I was just talking about, I like the spot. Basically, we park farther up this way and the creek kind of hits right here on a little crossing that comes into this back field. You can get in that creek, come all the way down the center and then pop up right here on this little ridge. What wind you would hunt it on is the question and I think North, Northwest, the problem is behind you, you have <clears throat> the west side of the farm, which is that bean field. I think towards the end of the day, that last hour a lot, your thermals are really gonna pull down into that creek. I'm excited to try it out. Break an ankle on this stuff. So here I'm pumped. I think we're gonna have a food source in here. Not only is it gonna have the corn, but we're gonna get the brassicas come up and hopefully create two little staging plots on either side of this draw. And when I got home that night, I started looking at Onyx. I knew I liked the tree, but a lot of foliage that time of year. And it's something that doesn't exactly stand out to you when you look at it, but we've got a great pinch point here. You can probably see it over my shoulder, but it's 40 yards from the tree stand to the west side of the farm right there. So. They're getting pinched down in this little draw. And on top of that, we're setting the inside corner of a field and it's a connection between two bedding areas. In the time between seeding the plots and the next trip to the farm, tight tent's pretty regular. He's not on camera every day, but he's pretty consistent. And generally it's on that northeast corner of the farm. September 20th rolls around and I'm sitting in my office doing some work and I get a FaceTime from Caleb. Check this out. This is the stuff where I planted. Look how good it's coming up, dude. 
He's gonna be jacked about this. Dude, you want some good news? Did you find the beast or the eight by seven? No, look at the green in this that you planted. Oh, dude, give me some videos of that. Dude. Look at it, it's super thick, dude. super lush, dude. There's a walnut tree right here. It's straight enough to get in there. I think you could cut it with the Northwest that's, wind. That's, that's literally the walnut that I talk about in the show that we were talking about that I was talking about in. Too much corn damage not to try it right there, man. It was like perfectly set up. As a land manager, there's few things that are rewarding as seeing your hard work pay off. And when Caleb FaceTimed me that day, I was pretty excited. You know, you think about these large ag fields and how you want to hunt them. A small green source to get a deer into bow range can be all the difference. About a week later, I'm finally getting my butt in gear. I get my tree stands ahead of the farm to put them out. And when I think back to 2022, I think Caleb and I got cameras out on the 30th of September. So I beat it by a day on the 29th. I love the way it sets up. It's weird being this low, especially as a big fella, but. Corn edge just comes up. I don't think I'm gonna trim anything. Walk by. Ideally, they're gonna come out and hopefully we can call them this way, but. We'll see how it works. A lot of times on, those, on camera last year, the deer seemed like they were kind of cutting across the middle of the field, so. I think we could even possibly hunt this one in Northwest and just cut it back across the CRP. We'll have to see how the deer move. We've got one more to hang. It's a little tighter to the bedding. We're gonna try and be quiet, but it's been a while since I hung a stand. Mike normally does them for me. About a month ago when we seeded this plot, I said I want to put a tree and Caleb came down when he gave me the update on those plots the other day. He said, dude, there's a walnut right there. You can get in, it'll be perfect. And I was like, yeah, that's the tree I already had picked out. So great minds think alike. So the one thing we were worried about would be the deer that are gonna be bedded on this ditch behind us. And sure enough, when we walked in today, there was a doe bedded. I don't know, 20 yards from the tree, and then another two does just up another 60 or 70 yards up the creek. So that's gonna be a risk. I think this is a, this is a sit that we hold off until like we have some really good intel on them. This tree leans a little more than I wanted it to, and uh, I'm trying to figure out where exactly I wanna get, but we'll just start climbing and see what happens. Ideally, I'd like to keep this limb right here, but I need to be able to shoot, so. That limb is bigger than I thought. Well, we just got her hung. I mean, that green is literally right here over my shoulder, and it really does look really good. I'm super impressed that that worked out. I hate to see the damage from the farmer's point of view, but from the bow hunter's point of view, I can live with it. I, I briefly looked at some other trees just, but I mean, they just put you out of the game. I feel like this is a good setup. And I mean, you can see everything. This entire field over the back corner, the hackberry tree we hung in, it's just over there, that golden tree. So I'm pumped. I think this is gonna work out good. Just right up that edge. It would be ideal, wouldn't it? So I feel uh, feel pretty confident, especially once those leaves fall off. I think when we originally talked about this stand, we talked about how the thermals are just gonna drop you into that creek. And I mean, the, the stand dumps right down that creek. The bank is right on the backside. So 
It should play perfect. We've got a pretty good view over to the west side of the farm on them soybeans. Once the leaves get off the trees, we should be able to see clear over to the field edge where the property line is. So not only a killing tree, but I feel like we can utilize those as observation set too. I'm super tickled with this set. So <laughs> oh, I can't wait to sit it. Can't wait to get some camouflage and be sitting here. Let's do it. September 29th. I'm not gonna say we're gonna kill out of this tree, but I bet you we have a shooter encounter out of this tree. So we may have to do a little jumbling around doing some hanging hunts, but I'm ready for it. Bring it on. At this point, I'm super excited. Coming out of that after hanging those stands, I've got good feelings about both of them. Throughout early October, I'm really just testing how I'm hunting, you know, really slowing down and trying to accomplish that goal, understanding the farm. I made my first sit on October 4th out of the Hackberry. And while we didn't have a great hunt, I learned a little bit. I saw where a lot of the deer were going on the far south side where they were coming out to the CRP and just feeding out there. And although I was seeing good winds where I could hunt the walnut stand, I'm thinking in my head, I don't want to hunt there. I don't want to dive into that spot. And early season when I didn't particularly have the good intel that I wanted, I didn't see it was worth the risk to go in there. Mike and I were hunting DK a lot, and here it is mid-October, and I don't really have a plan. Tight 10's kind of went missing. He's been off the farm for about a week. The 13th, Caleb comes in here and finds the HD kills. And immediately in my head, your heart sinks. You think, he's gone. You know, a deer that's here so regularly just kind of disappears. And I'm kind of having some internal turmoil about whether I should go hunt or not. And at the end of the day, I love to deer hunt. I love to be outside. and. We came out, we went and hunted, and the hopes were, I'm gonna lay eyes on Type 10, he's just not utilizing the farm, he's not coming by the cameras, and as most hunts go, he doesn't show up. I still kind of have some anxiety about maybe he's uh, succumbed to DHD or not, but that didn't last long. He shows up October 16th, I'm super excited, I'm kind of revitalized and think about how we're gonna go after him. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to hunt too many days there from the 16th to the 20th, but on the 20th, a huge surprise. And I mean a giant surprise. Just a big deer, not really able to identify it right off the bat. Caleb and I get talking, and it's a deer we know from last year, a deer we were both excited to see if it showed back up. Now, I think any sane man would be in a tree stand the next day if he had a wind direction after a deer like that shows up. But my primary responsibility in the fall is to film Mike, and I have other responsibilities along with that. I get to see some of the coolest things hunting with Mike, and I truly do love that and the time spent together. Mike and I have built a great friendship over the years, and I wouldn't trade that for the world. So from the 21st to the 30th, I'm filming Mike. Lo and behold, DK shows up on the 30th. Mike puts an arrow in him. Obviously the canoe story, that's one we all love. But as a producer, there's a lot that comes after the kill that we're doing where I didn't hunt the 31st or the first. And on the second, Mike's back after it going after Fitzmagic. And all the while, Tight 10, the big deer, they're all over the farm, they're daylight. And I'm getting super pumped for when I can make my first sit of November. And for me, that wasn't until November 6th. So I go in, I'm kind of wondering where to hunt. We have a west wind that night. And with the times hunting that Hackberry throughout the season, I thought I was maybe a little too far out of the bedding. And with it getting to November, I decided to get a little bit closer. I used a blind, I set up, they've cut the corn at this point, and the cameras are showing a ton of deer activity. So we get in, we get set up, see some great activity, but just no mature bucks. And the next two days, I was with Mike back filming on the 7th and 8th, and then suddenly it's November 9th, my first morning sit of the year. Finally, we've got a northwest wind, and I'm going to sit the walnut stand. Right off the bat, first thing that morning, these does come from the hedgerow to the north and immediately to the green plot and fed in the green plot. Again, I go back to the, the side of just reward for the work you put in. Just to see them come in and utilize that was exciting. And then shortly after that, a beautiful two-year-old eight point comes through, nose on the ground, just following those does trail back to bedding. I think we rattled one small buck in that morning after that. But other than that, most of the deer we saw were way off to the east using the hillside to go back to the bedding. So knowing the wind was going to switch from northwest to west that evening, I kind of had it in my head I was going to go sit the same spot I did on November 6th. And boy, am I glad I did. Well, we just got set up in the blind. Uh, we stuck with the plan we made before we got down out of the walnut stand pretty gusty anywhere from like 12 25 mile an hour depending on the gusts but it's a strong good west it's gonna it's what we want for this we're hunting basically just a hedgerow on the edge of the property the goal deer come out in the ag field hopefully a target comes out and we can either they see the decoy and come on their own or it puts us in a calling situation I think you could hunt this without the decoy but I just feel like the decoy with a specifically a mature buck 
gives you a little bit better odds to get them in bow range. And uh, probably won't do much calling tonight just because the wind's hitting us in the face. Your calling doesn't carry too far. We don't want the deer to come in behind us. So we'll be kind of selective when we call. We just got back to the truck. It is uh, just about an hour after illegal shooting light. We stayed in the blind a while. That's officially the biggest deer I've ever seen hunting for myself. Um, I mean, he's, he's large. I can't wait to go back and look at the footage. <laughs> I'm a little speechless and I've thought about this the whole way over here, like what exactly to talk about. And there's two things I learned from this hunt. I mean, number one, that is a dominant deer. And there was one snort wheeze where he picked his head up and he looked over at me and he turned his back, gave me a tail flick. And it's almost saying like to the decoy, if you want some, come over here and get some because he's got nine does standing there with him. You almost are going to have to get in his bubble to get a reaction out of him. I think we've got a pretty good shot at them in the morning. So uh, the big deer went off to the northeast and tight 10 went to the south. So I'm hoping if I get in that same stand, the wind's gonna be even a little bit better for it. It's gonna we'll just go right over the creek tomorrow morning. It's cool to see both of them. I mean, what a, what a night. about 80 yards, about 
about 10 minutes before legal shooting light, looking for a doe, so. And I talked to Mike last night, one of the things he said was that deer, if he's by himself, he has a lot better opportunity at calling at him, so. Hopefully, he gets back there, and uh, he wants to come play. It's really quiet this morning, so our sound should carry a good ways. Ideally, I'm set up for him to come in on the other side of the creek, but it's gonna be a little more challenging on the field edge. He's by himself, so we've got a chance this morning. We're just gonna stick with it and see what happens. does out there and I was watching them and there was a small buck over there and Arnold came running out of the bean field and I mean I got like a glimpse of him coming behind me and he didn't come through the shooting lane but hopefully I mean it doesn't look like one of these does is necessarily hot tight tens definitely just going around and checking each of the does so it's been a great morning so far both of our shooters again this morning
That's such a big white tail. <laughs> I just, uh, I just messed it up. I'm gonna watch the footage, but I mean, I got no penetration. I, I mean, there's a chance. I'm just overestimating it. Maybe I got high lung, but I think I hit him high shoulder. I mean, you can't ask it. I mean, you can't ask for a plan to go any better. I mean, on this point right here, falls edge. He gets to here, he kind of like locked up for a second. He cut out a little bit right there, 30 yards, right where I ranged earlier on the edge of the green plot. And, um, 29.7. Oh man. Well, we are about five hours post shot right now. I did not go look at the arrow or try and find the arrow. Went back and looked at the footage. That deer actually, he ducked substantially. I mean, 12 inches. It's one of those things, you stop a deer and they're alerted to what's going on around you. We all know there's a lot of variables and it's not like that was all that long of a shot, it was 30 yards. So a lot of things to think about. Obviously, anytime you take a shot at a deer and hit a deer, you owe it to the animal to follow up and make sure that it's not lethal. Um, there is a chance that this deer could be dead. So off the A order where it comes off the heart, there's two main veins that come up behind the scapula. My hopes honestly aren't all that high. The good thing about all this is if we don't find him, pretty confident say that deer is gonna live to see another day. And the four of us are gonna go see what we can find. Some blood next to the arrow. Broke off. Four or five inches. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's enough. We've got it in that plus what broke off, and it's in the right spot. I mean, it's definitely enough. Got one more time. Well, unfortunately, we did not recover that deer. And like I said at the beginning, um, didn't go in with the most confidence in the world. We tracked blood across the cornfield, like I said, and when we got into the grass, we found some bigger spots and kind of like hopes picked up a little bit. But as we kept going, we were only finding blood on like standing vegetation. It was drying up, it wasn't leaking down. So when you do, when you see that, it's generally an indication of a, a non-lethal hit. So. Hopefully throughout the next couple days, we can get some more pictures of this deer. There's more hunting ahead. We've got you this weekend. I'm sure you're, are you going back out tonight? I think we're, we're gonna have to. We got stuff sitting in a blind we gotta go get. <laughs> <laughs> well, perfect. I uh, there just for the perfect yeah. time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the last half hour. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I do appreciate these guys being out here. It means a lot. And uh, as tough as this pill is to swallow, it makes it a little bit easier spending with people like these guys. So. We'll move on and uh, we'll see you next time we're in the stand. So as you guys can imagine in that moment, I'm pretty distraught. I'm pretty upset. Uh, that moment slipped through my fingertips. At the end of the day, I moved out here to Iowa for a career and I've had that opportunity. But the reason I moved out here is white-tailed deer. And uh, it sucks, you know? I, I watch that clip once a week at this point. Probably never gonna forget it, but on the bright side, having Mike, Zach, Ty out here, came out and gave up their evenings just to help me track a deer that we all knew most likely we weren't gonna find based on the shot, but you gotta do your due diligence. And it really made that moment a lot easier, a little bit easier of a pill to swallow for me. So to this day, thank you all. I appreciate all of you. And on top of those guys, I really have to give a huge thank you to Caleb. You know, I've said it, I don't know how many times this video, but it means the world to me for him to let me hunt here. and. To have a deer like that come in bow range, and you think about how tough of a season Caleb had last year with EHD, and we talked many times. I was like, dude, go hunt it. I'm filming Mike, I can't hunt down here. And uh, he just wanted to give me an opportunity to hunt down here, and thank you, man, I appreciate it. Thankfully, the next day, 
I wasn't upset for too long. Mike and I caught up with Fitz Magic. He was about as close to the tree as we are right now. And on top of that, three days later from after targeting Fitz Magic, the deer shows back up on camera. In that time, tight 10's still on the farm. We make some sits throughout November. And I think I had one encounter with tight 10. He was bedded with a doe and he actually almost pushed her to the tree and she changed directions and ran back in the bedding at about 90 yards. And then honestly, probably my favorite hunt of the year was the hunt I got to swim with my wife out of this tree. And we had two really good bucks come in that day. One had a big old split G3. I don't think I've ever seen a buck with a split three like that. Then we had a big three-year-old come under it. I mean, he worked right under the tree exactly like you want him to. It would have been her biggest deer and kudos to her because if I was in her shoes at that time of my career, I would have been trying to send an arrow of that deer. So really proud of her for that. Uh, made a couple more hunts throughout the year and never had any encounters. He shed his antlers, I think, pretty early after that. So beyond that, I'm not really sure what happened to him. But when I look back at the 2023 season, I really mark it up as a success. My overall goal at the beginning of the year was to learn this property and learn how the deer utilize it. And just based off the hunts we have this year, I think we really accomplished that. On top of using the monster buck, to create small pockets of green source to get deer in bow range. Again, as I said in the summer, that was a test. I wanted to see if it was work. And now that I know I have that in my arsenal, that's a tool moving forward that I'm definitely gonna utilize. So with all that being said, who knows what's gonna come in the 2024 season. I'm really excited. I know the team has a lot of great off-season projects that are coming up. We appreciate you guys. I hope you enjoyed the episode. And we'll see you next week.